on March 1st, 1996, Lenny Wilkins, coaching the Atlanta Hawks, leads them to a victory over the Cleveland Cavaliers, making him the first NBA head coach to win over a thousand games. Here's the story behind this often forgotten about Hall of Fame coach and player today on Daily Sports History. Welcome to Daily Sports History. I'm Ethan Reese, your guide to a rapid deep dive into sports history every day. Lenny Wilkins was born in New York and grew up in Brooklyn back in the 1940s and 50s and grew to love the game of basketball, which New York was the epicenter for at the time. Though he struggled for playing time on his high school team, making it as a freshman but not playing until his junior year, he was able to get a scholarship from Providence College with a little help from his father. And that's where his career really took off. He became a two-time All-American at Providence leading them to their first NIT appearance, which at the time was the major final college tournament, and led them to the finals of the NIT in 1960, something Providence had never done before. And when he left, he was the second leading scorer all time in school history. And in 1996, the school actually retired his number 14 number. And he was doing so well that he got drafted number six overall by the St. Louis Hawks in the 1960 NBA draft. But at the time, there was only eight teams. The first two picks that year were Oscar Robinson and Jerry West, two Hall of Fame NBA players. But the Hawks were a really good team, and he helped bolster that team, helping them all the way to the finals his rookie year, where they eventually lost to the Boston Celtics. But Wilkins continued to improve on the court. Despite only being 6'1", he showed great skill as a point guard, and in the 68th season, he was voted second in the MVP race, losing to the dominant force at the time, Will Chamberlain. But unfortunately, after that season, he got traded to the Seattle Supersonics. And this is a move that would change his career forever. Because after being in Seattle for a year, they fired their head coach. And the owner, Gabe Delaney, and asked, would you be a player coach for us? Originally, he said no. But the owner eventually wore him down as Lenny thought, well, everyone already says I'm a coach on the court. Why couldn't I be the actual coach as well? And he helped improve that team to get a winning record by his third season coaching the team. Despite leading them to the winning record, they missed the playoffs and the team decided to trade him to Cleveland in a very unpopular move as he was ingrained with the Supersonics in the city of Seattle. And over 200 season ticket holders signed a petition saying they would be relinquishing their tickets if this trade went through. And sadly, it did. But Lenny viewed this as a little bit of a blessing in disguise as it allowed him to just go back to playing and not being a coach as well. Because being a player and a coach took its toll. It was something that was more popular in the 60s. And we even saw Bill Russell of the Boston Celtics be a player coach for three of their championships. But... It is two jobs. It is a lot of work. So when he went to Cleveland, he was only a player who was allowed to focus on that. But after two seasons, he got traded again to the Portland Trailblazers. And that's where he would end his career in 1975, scoring a total of 17,000 points. And he was a nine-time All-Star. And when he retired, he was second all-time in assists in the league behind Oscar Robinson. But shortly after he retired, the Portland Trailblazers fired their head coach and asked if he would come back and coach the team. And this is where his coaching career really took off in Portland for two seasons before taking an executive role with the team in 1976. And the next year, Seattle fired their head coach and Lenny finally stepped in and helped lead them all the way to the NBA Finals that year. And in the 1978-79 season, he led them to the, a 52-30 and 30 record, enough to be first in their division, and led them all the way to the NBA Finals, where they defeated the Washington Bullets, who they had lost to the previous year, and defeated them in three games. And the most impressive thing is, they did this despite not having a Hall of Famer 
or even an all-star on their team. And Bieber continued to coach the Supersonics all the way until 1984, where he would be eventually let go and he would make his way to the Cleveland Cavaliers, where he would lead them to the playoffs every year he was there, except for the 1990 season. And after being let go, he made his way to Atlanta Hawks, where he would continue to have success there. But in January 1995, while coaching the Hawks, he became the all-time winning, winningest coach, passing Boston Celtics legend Red Auerbach with his 939th win. In the following year, he would win his 1,000th game on March 1st, 1996, when the Hawks beat his former team, the Cleveland Cavaliers, 74-68. to And after missing the playoffs in the 2000 season, Atlanta would let Wilkins go, where he would make his way to Toronto to coach for three seasons, making the playoffs his first two seasons. And he would go on to finish his career with the New York Knicks. And he finished his career with 1,332 wins all the time, which was the most upon his retirement. He has since been passed by Don Nelson and Greg Popovich. But another record Lenny does have is he also has the most losses by a head coach, with 1,155. But just by having the most losses, he still has a winning record as a head coach. And he's often forgot about when we talk about the greatest coaches of all time. You always throw out people like Red Auerbach, Bill Jackson, Greg Popovich. Understandably, they have way more NBA titles than Lenny Wilkins ever had. We often forget about the players Lenny Wilkins also had, as those other great coaches had multiple Hall of Fame players on their team. And Lenny Wilkins only ever coached one Hall of Fame player, and that was himself. He never got the chance to have a Hall of Fame player on his team and grow a dynasty, which he may have. That one NBA title he had, he had no Hall of Famers on the team. They were just a great team together. And he made the playoffs consistently with his teams. But despite that, he's often forgotten about. But he should always be remembered, not only because he was the first, but because he was great despite any team he played for. And he helped stabilize a lot of franchises that were starting out in the league. Thank you for listening to today's Daily Sports History. If you like that, please hit that share button wherever you're listening and send it to a friend so they can become a sports historian just like you. Come back tomorrow for more Daily Sports History.